Welcome everybody to OpenSUSE Conference 2021 and to my talk about the state of free software for healthcare. As you all know, uh, health is a very special good and it needs special attendance when it comes to data protection and security around healthcare software. And this is basically where I want to talk about. A little bit about me. Uh, I'm an electrical engineer by, by education. I work as a project manager and business consultant and help companies to optimize their supply chain. Um, often but not always in conjunction with SAP software. Um, I'm a happy user of uh, free software since the 90s, um, end of 90, 1998, I think. I converted completely to uh, SUSE at that time. I'm an um, OpenSUSE contributor and on the OpenSUSE board since a couple of years. Um, additionally, I work on the GNU Health Core team and support the Open Forum Europe, which is a Brussels based think tank for uh, policymakers in um, decision and research. So, what is free software? Um, if you take a look at your smartphone, for example, you have a hell of apps on it, probably around 100 plus. And for how many have you really paid? If you think quickly about it, I think in my case, it's about five or six apps that I uh, have paid for. And for the rest, um, you pay basically with, uh, yeah, you pay nothing. But is this now free software or is it gratis software? In many cases, it is gratis software because you pay with your data and you have uh, no control about it. So free of charge or gratis does not necessarily mean that the software is really free as in freedom. So if you cannot look into it because it is not open, then you have to trust what the supplier tells you about a software. So if you don't know anything, you have to believe everything. And some common statements about security and data protection are, well, your privacy and the protection of your data is important for us. We treat your data in accordance with GDPR. Um, yes, uh, we have to believe this, but how is the reality? Let's take a look at the Luca app. The holy Luca app that was promoted by a hip hop singer and suddenly said, yeah, this is the solution for our Corona issues. Um, that was originally a, a closed source program, which by public pressure was then released under open source. Um, it pointed out quite quickly that it has a hell of uh, open source license violations. And additionally, it has some severe security issues. So it allows you um, to, for example, a, a code injection that would enable you to take the Ministry of Health down. You would be able to see uh, data that was not uh, intended for you. So basically, the Luca app is used to check in at a restaurant or something like that. So you could see uh, other people's names and, and data around it. And this has everything that we really do not want. It has, for example, a central data storage with, um, with a private company a private profit-oriented company. So everything that we wanted with the Corona warning app to what we wanted to avoid with the Corona warning app is coming around with this Luca app. And surprisingly, um, when you usually need five offers, if you want to buy about 10 pencils for 20 euros, um, some German states have just bought these licenses without a regular uh, procurement process and they've wasted about more than 20 million euros on it. And um, the security experts rating on this application is it has a lot of money 
for a very low benefit and very high risk. So if I'm going to a restaurant and somebody asks me to use the, the Luca app, I just deny it. Another example from the German healthcare system is the electronic patient record, Elektronische Patientenakte, which is uh, publicly available since the 1st of January of this year. And um, if you look at the app stores from from Google or un unfortunately not an, an Android, for example, you don't find them, or uh, for for iOS and Apple, you find around, uh, I don't know, 90 or 100 electronic health records, one for each um, uh, insurance company. And I'm really asking myself at this point, public money, public code, so have every health insurance invented their own um, electronic patient record that really looks like it is. But the main issue with these electronic health records are the user has no ownership or you don't have any control over your data. And the Federal Data Protection Commissioner of, the, uh, of Germany advises not to use it in its current state because everything is freely visible. You cannot share your information with uh, a certain doctor, but it's everything just visible for everybody. An improvement about this is expected for January 2022, when the, the next release of this uh, electronic patient record comes out. Um, until that point in time, I would really not advise anybody to use it. Uh, if you think this is worse, um, no, it can. The worst can even be improved. For example, with the Vivi app, this is a electronic health record as well. It's also closed source. It's gratis. Um, it has in between probably some hundred thousand installations more than when I created these slides. Um, it is promoted by more than forty German health insurances. And right at the start, there were severe data uh, security issues detected. Basically, all documents that you've shared with your doctor were public visible. You share the, the information who shared what with which, with which doctor, uh, your name, photo, mail address, date of birth, insurance numbers from you, but as well as from the doctors were visible. The reason were that there were conceptual misunderstanding in the usage of RSA encryption and key management. Um, and these could be used, for example, to, to read uh, the secret keys, the private keys of your doctors as well. Um, and if this is not enough, they share a lot of personal data with so-called third-party tracking tools. I come to the meaning of the third-party tracking tools uh, later on. But let's have a look at another example. This is, for example, the Erda Health app. Same as before, uh, it's closed source and it's gratis. It has more than 500, 5 million installations. It gives you a unit tracking ID. It, has, it shares your personal data and symptoms as well with third-party trackers. And it shares your data with the trackers and Facebook even before you get the data protection guidelines presented and you can approve or deny it. That means even if you say, oh no, I don't want this app, I, I deny the use of my data, then Facebook was already informed about it. Um, they're also sharing your shell health insurance data with Facebook, for example. I don't know why they do it, but they just do it. And as you know, it is a US-based company. US Cloud Act allows US officials to access the data without informing you about this. So this is basically an, an issue with, with all cloud-based um, cloud applications. So while we talk about the third-party trackers, um, once your data is available, once it's in the wild, uh, there is basically no chance to get the data back. 
And these third-party trackers are sharing your information as well with so-called fourth-party trackers. And there was an analysis of about 24 health up some time ago. And scientists who did this research allocated about 200 fourth-tier companies who have potentially access to your data. So most of the data is not really fully anonymized and it's enriched with meta metadata. So it should be possible to identify with a big data analysis of the data to identify individuals by combining multiple sources. Well, there was a project that was stopped later on where the National Health Service in the UK wanted to share data with uh, Google. Um, after this was stopped, Google found an agreement with one of the largest uh, uh, US-based companies, Ascension, to collect and analyze health data of millions of patients. So neither the patients nor the doctors have been told about the project and they haven't given their consent to Google um, to access their data. So they probably don't even know that Google is processing their data. And everybody knows uh, how well networked Google is. It combined all information about you from many different sources. And last but not least, not to forget, Google has recently bought Fitbit. Fitbit is a producer of uh, smartwatches and health trackers and something like that. So what they're doing in the end of the day is they take your data because you have to have a cloud account with Fitbit uh, to process this data, analyze these data and maybe sell those results back to you. This is another example where you really don't have any but really not any control over your data. So the situation on the smartphone and with your health applications is quite difficult. Um, how does it look on the de desktop? So the Federal Data Protection Officers of the uh, German states analyzed, for example, um, Windows 10 and they see little options to use Windows 10 in a legally compliant manner. So if you buy a computer nowadays and it mostly comes pre-installed with Windows, uh, you basically have no chance to avoid um, an ID, a record, an account with Microsoft. They just don't let you do it. Or you need to search the internet upfront to find the tricks how to get around it. But for the average user, it's fairly impossible. They are sharing data with their servers in the US and they do not tell you what data uh, they are really sharing, nor are they seeking uh, your consent upfront. So you can only select between uh, little data sharing and much data sharing, but nothing about the details. Um, even if you have reduced the data transfer to an absolute minimum, and this can only be for those areas where it is known in between that it is transferred, there is still a reminder of encrypted data being transferred in the US. And um, it, is not, it is not told what data this really is. Microsoft just denies uh, the information. And as long as it is not clear, it has to be treated as an illegal data transfer. And I'm really surprised that uh, there is nothing done against it. But my assumption is, if they do anything about it, then uh, the public sector has immediately a problem because most of them are using proprietary software. So if you think this is bad, uh, it's even worse for Office 365 and Teams. Uh, 365, for example, submits between 23 and 25,000 so-called event types to Microsoft, uh, whereas Windows 10 only submits about 2,000 data types. And um, it is not in detail known what this is. 
But nevertheless, if you think you can trust uh, Microsoft, remember Microsoft is partnering with the NSA, with the National Security Agency. This is the spyware network of the US and they are showing day zero exploits um, to the NSA that would allow them to spy on basically everybody. But let's come back to, to healthcare. Um, for, for various reasons, healthcare is magnetizing hackers. So not only that the healthcare is part of a critical infrastructure, every device that is connected somehow can be a target of attack. Um, we have seen in the last years uh, various cases where uh, single hospitals or nearly the half uh, healthcare system has to be shut down due to uh, ransomware attacks. But if we think on a little bit more, you mostly do not know when you are really infected unless something happens. And in case of a geopolitical crisis, it can happen that your healthcare system is shut down by a remote attacker who was maybe on your system for some time already, but you just didn't know. Um, another interesting area are search results and large data sets, for example, from, from clinical studies. And uh, here it is said that especially hacker groups coming from China are interested in these uh, data sets. And we're not just talking about here uh, search results on COVID or uh, vaccination material for that. So by hiding our source code, having security by obscurity, we do not really have an option to avoid um, hacker attacks or to increase the security. Say it very frankly, security by obscurity has never worked so far. So what is the alternative? The alternative is digital sovereignty. We need to have full control over the software stack and ideally about the hardware stack as well if we want to have digital sovereignty. We have some discussion going on since some time about whether we should let Huawei support the 5G cell network um, build up. Um, many public um, bodies are scared that there may be a kind of skill switch or um, spyware software or whatever within uh, the network devices of Huawei. But I mean, nobody talks about, for example, the largest supplier for network infrastructure, which is, for example, uh, Cisco. Um, Cisco has as well frequently issues with their security in terms of software, but as well there were software devices manipulated, sold via a Swiss company for many, many years who allowed the secret services to spy on the customers of exactly this, uh, these devices. Another enemy that nearly everybody has on his desktop is the Intel management engine. So every Intel-based computer has the so-called management engine on board, which is a small processor in itself. It has a separate operating system and it's completely undisclosed what this thing is doing. So, um, cut. Internal management engine, what this thing is doing. Get weiter. Intel denies any information about the management engine and keep in mind it has access to all resources even before the hardware, uh, sorry, before the software your operating system boots. So uh, it can basically do anything. As a consequence of this, China has announced to ban all foreign hard and software. Um, and to only run on local resources, so local, locally produced hardware, locally produced software. 
So that means, in theory, China is doing the right thing to gain digital sovereignty. But in fact, they're doing it for the wrong purpose. They're doing it for censorship, for control and for social scoring and not for the sake of freedom. So let's have a look at what means free software and what does it mean to, uh, to the user. So first of all, we need to be able to run it in the way that we wish for any purpose about it. We need to be able to distribute this software that we're just running and um, give copies to, to our friends or whatever. We need to be able to study how it works and to change the source code as we need it. And we need to be able to distribute the software with changes. So if you compare this with uh, the, 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 the hardware that you're running on your desktop, or the system that you're running on your desktop and your smartphone, um, how does it match the reality? Okay, we're on the OpenSUSE conference. I guess most of you run OpenSUSE, you're on the safe side, but I guess for the smartphones, um, it's really still an issue. For free software in healthcare, there is a market. Here is an overview about a couple of healthcare systems um, that claim to be free software. Some of them are unmet in, uh, unmaintained in between, like GNU Met, for example. Some of them are for special uh, purposes, for example, for US uh, veterans um, hospitals. And others are, for example, only available in some countries, for example, Hospital OS which is some, has some more than, than 200 installations in Thailand, for example. Even if they claim in a name that they are an open software, then that does not always mean that this software is really free, because it may build on top of proprietary technology. So if you have a free software healthcare system that runs on, let's say, Microsoft SQL Server, it's not a free system anymore. Full stop. Some of these so-called open systems like Open Dental may ask you for a trial license to try and start this software. Forget it. It's not an open software anymore. Open Dental is a very bad case because they claim, oh yes, we are a free software, but uh, and, and, and we have released our source code, but if you look at it, the source code that they released is five or ten years old and has nothing to do with the software that they're distributing and their standard proprietary solution nowadays. And another option or another issue may occur that the software runs free at the moment, but as soon as you need an upgrade, for example, you're entitled to um, to send, for example, the database to the supplier and uh, they do the upgrade for you and charge you for this. And if you have these kind of hidden locks, it's also not a free software solution as well. If you want to read more about this, take a look at GNU.org. Uh, when free software depends on non-free, for example, which, which describes very well what the issues is if we don't have a fully free software stack. So let's take a look at some free software application. For example, the Corona Warning app is free software. It is developed by the Robert Koch Institute in Germany. Um, Technical development is done by, by, by Telekom and SAP. It's released under the Apache license and has some more than 28 million installations so far. The transparent or the development process itself is transparent and open. I mean, it's, it's hosted on GitHub, which is not ideal as well as GitHub is uh, run by a privately owned company who um, keeps for them the right to do whatever they want. And uh, as we had the cases already, they were discriminating users based on their physical location. So the hosting on GitHub is not really ideal, but uh, better than completely um, unfree hosted. The app itself has 
a decentral and privacy focused data store completely in opposite to what we've seen at the Luca app before. Um, I think the producers of the Corona app did many things right, but when it was announced in the beginning, it was a completely overrated, if not to say a hyped value proposition of what it can do. And in the end, or after the first release, it, it pointed really out that the benefit for the user is really limited. So you could see that you had some risk uh, persons around you, but it doesn't, didn't tell you uh, when this happened and where this happened. This has to do with some um, technical restrictions between the Bluetooth stack on Android and something like that. Um, but I mean, they're learning and they're picking up. And in between, you can add your vaccination status to this Corona application. Um, and I think it was the right move. Um, and then, of course, we have uh, GNU Health, which is a fully free software stack it's an official GNU package uh, supported by the Free Software Foundation. We have open documentation. We, uh, it is built to run on free software like Linux-based systems, uh, FreeBSD. Um, OpenSUSE is actually the only Linux distribution that ships GNU Health already in the standard. It is also tested on OpenQA. The underlying technology is free as well. So Open uh, Postgres SQL, for example, it's developed on Python. The encryption is done with GNU PG. We use the uh, Qt and Kirigami stack for the mobile application and use the Triton ERP framework uh, as background. GNU Health itself is uh, modular. It has a core module and we can install many modules around it. Its origination was in social medicine where it is now beginning uh, to gain attention again in terms of COVID-19 pandemics. We can use GNU Health for contact tracing, for example, that is used for exactly this in, in Argentina, for example. But we can also um, work on precision medicine as we've incorporated the genome database from the Unipod project, for example. And beside this, we have everything that you need to run a hospital, like financial accounting, supply chain, pharmacy module, management of, of beds and, and health professionals and something like that. And we cover basically all medical areas that are needed in the latest release we've added a module uh, for dental healthcare so you can have now also an odontogram from your your teeth for example my GNU health the personal health record was built in cooperation with the kde team and it will show up in um, in tumbleweed very soon so my GNU Health keeps the data that you want to record, keeps you, it keeps it personal, it keeps it on your device, it does not share it with anybody else unless you uh, want to do so. We want to set up a federation server for that where you are free to collect, connect to, uh, but as said, our main goal is to keep your information with yourself and make it available to you, first of all. Let me at the end um, talk about the difficulties that we're having when implementing free software in healthcare. The development models of free and proprietary software are completely different. So if you have, for example, the 28th edition of a screencasting module or a screenshot editor, oh, you really have to think about what can I add additionally to make my customer pay for the next release. So in many cases, this, this software is completely over-engineered. 
right? The development is, is quite slow. You have to pay up front. Um, the maintenance is maybe based on license fees. So they charge you some additional 20 to 25% annual fees from your original license amount uh, just to get the maintenance for the software. So this ends up in total in a, in a very high total cost of ownership. The open source development model is quite different. We have really proven software uh, and proven software modules that are being used in there. As the development process itself is collaborative, it is also fast. You don't have to pay upfront, you only pay for what you need. If you say, I host it myself, I run it myself, you ha don't have additional fees. If you want to have service for it, you can um, buy a, a subscription and you get service for your uh, software. This is, for example, where, where SUSE, uh, one of our largest sponsors, makes the money mit. In the end of the day, it points out, we have a lower total cost of ownership. But the world is not all green because uh, we are really here knocking on the door of big business modules of the proprietary software vendors. So they are spreading fears, uncertainties and doubts. So like the quality of the code is bad, there is no support, it is unsecure and so on. And this is complete bullshit. The only thing on this slide that is halfway true is the last one. You're mostly not getting fired when you're buying IBM or Microsoft or SAP. If the shit hits the fan, then you can say, oh, but if that was with ooh, SAP or something like that, um, if they cannot do it right, how could anybody else do it right? I mean, I remember one case where a software introduction at a retail store uh, went wrong and they burned some 500 million euros on this uh, failed software implementation with SAP. I think in this case, this last sentence is uh, not fully true as well. <laughs> so another aspect on this is the way that the software gets into the company. A proprietary software is always pushed into a company or into a hospital while a free software needs to be pulled in because there is simply no, no sales team, right? Um, I don't know of any free software, fully free software project that has a sales team. But if you're saying, oh, I want to have a CRM software or something like that, and you're asked the typical vendors, they come around with a sales team next door, uh, next day, and they're on your doorsteps and telling you why you have to tell that, uh, why you have to, to, to buy this software. There is some lack of understanding still in the, in, in the market, in the industry, about how free software is uh, being used and how it has to be handled. So to come to the end of my, of my talk and to summarize it up, our health and our medical data require special observance and we really need the highest uh, security standards. As we have seen, many of the proprieta proprietary software solutions do not meet these standards and for this reason may not be trustworthy. So if you really want to deal with, uh, with your health care in a sensitive manner, make sure that you re use some free applications for that. And we need to have the full control over our software stack and hardware stack as the basis for security and freedom. Thank you very much for your attention. In case of questions, feel free to ask. Thank you.